Lucky Strong, and this is VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Mario Ritter Jr. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Brian Lynn takes a look at both sides of the debate over cell phone bans in American classrooms. Then we hear an everyday grammar lesson all about modals. Finally, we present the lesson of the day from Andrew Smith and Jill Robbins. But first... A mass shooting at an American high school has raised questions about policies restricting cell phone use in classrooms. The shooting took place September 4th at Appalachie High School in the southern state of Georgia. The suspect was identified as Colt Gray, a 14-year-old student at the school. The shooting left two students and two teachers dead. Nine others were injured. During the shooting, some students at Appalachie High School used cell phones to call their parents to let them know what was happening. Others made calls to loved ones to leave messages they thought might end up being final goodbyes. Some opponents of cell phone bans in schools have said such situations demonstrate a reason cell phones should not be completely banned from classrooms. They believe phone bans can cut off a possible lifeline for parents to make sure their children are safe during school shootings or other emergencies. But supporters of such restrictions, including many teachers, say the rules are needed. They say cell phones can cause many distractions for students. Carrie Rodriguez is president of the National Parents' Union, an education activist group. She said she understands that parents are deeply concerned about whether or not they're going to get timely information about their kids in emergency situations. Rodriguez told the Associated Press, AP, the fact of the matter is parents and families cannot rely on schools to effectively communicate with us in times of emergency. And this has happened time and again. Nationwide, 77% of U.S. schools say they currently ban cell phones for non-school-related work. That number comes from the National Center for Education Statistics. But experts say the number is misleading and does not necessarily mean students are following the bans or that all schools are effectively enforcing them. In the southern state of Arkansas, Republican Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders offered school districts a state-supported financial assistance program. It helps administrators buy containers to hold students' phones during the school day. In California, Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom has urged school districts to restrict cell phone use. He is considering signing legislation that would require schools to enact restrictions. Newsom recently told reporters... I'd hate to see another school shooting be the reason that we bring TVs into the classroom and then disrupt our children's education. 
He explained that permitting school children to have cell phones in school is almost like letting them watch television in class. Doing so, Newsom said, can greatly disrupt the learning process. But opponents of phone bans say the device can be helpful for students facing dangerous situations at school. For example, some students caught in the Appalachie shooting were able to use their phones to contact loved ones during moments they feared could be their last. One student, high school junior Julie Sandoval, told the AP she texted her mother from inside the school, I love you. I love you so much. In another message, she wrote, I'm sorry I'm not the best daughter. I love you. Sandoval said she heard another student during the shooting speaking with her mother on the phone. She was heard saying, They're shooting up the school. They're shooting up the school. But some supporters of phone restrictions warn that permitting students to use phones during shootings or other emergencies could put them in even more danger. Kim Whitman is co-founder of the Phone Free Schools movement. The group supports school policies to keep cell phones out of students' hands during class. What's even more important to me is their safety, Whitman said. She noted, for example, that a child on the phone with a loved one during a school emergency might miss important guidance from teachers or school officials. That's a worse scenario in my mind, Whitman added. Students in other school shootings have used cell phones to inform school officials or parents about the incidents. During the 2022 school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, which killed 21 people, a fourth grader called 911 to get help. And during a 2018 shooting at Florida's Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, students used their phones to communicate with loved ones and shoot video of the shooting. I'm Brian Lynn. Brian Lynn joins me now to talk more about that report. Hi, Brian. Thanks for being here. Of course, Ashley. Glad to be here. Your report dealt with the reasons some parents might not want schools to completely ban cell phones in the classroom. Let's look at some of the words that appeared in the story. Sure, that sounds good. First, let's discuss the term distraction. A basic definition for this word, a noun, would be something that draws attention away from something else. In the report, distraction was used to describe things that can take away a student's attention from their schoolwork. In this case, the distractions were linked to the cell phones. The verb form of this word is distract, and one could say, for example, that cell phones are responsible for distracting students. All right, and how about the word disrupt? which is used in the report as a verb. Yes, disrupt is generally used to describe the process of interfering with something else. So when a process is disrupted, it is stopped from continuing as it should. Uh, the report states that schoolwork can be disrupted, for example, because of various distractions, the word we just discussed earlier. Are there any other words you'd like to look at? Sure. How about the term scenario, a noun? A simple definition of this one would be a description of a particular situation or series of events. And this description can be either real or imagined. 
In the report, for example, scenario is used to describe a bad series of events that might happen if certain conditions are not met. And in American English, the word is often used in the phrase worst-case scenario, which means the worst possible result that happens in a certain situation. Okay. Thanks so much for joining me, Brian, and thanks for that report. You're welcome, Ashley. Thank you. For VOA Learning English, this is Everyday Grammar. This week, we are going to show you how to give advice using modal verbs. Modal verbs, called modals for short, are auxiliary verbs that express a speaker's attitude and the strength of that attitude. For example, He should visit Prague. In this sentence, should is the modal verb and visit is the main verb. The simple form of a verb goes after a modal. Do not add the third person S to a verb after a modal. It would sound strange to say, He should visit Prague. Or, He should to visit Prague. The correct way is, He should visit Prague. There are about 17 modals in English. Grammar experts do not agree on an exact number. Today, we will focus on three common modals used for giving advice. Should, ought to, and had better. Let's start with should. Should has multiple meanings. It can be used to express certainty, such as, He should be here by 5 o'clock. Should can be a substitute for the conditional word if. You might hear someone say, Should you need help, just ask me. But more often, we use should to give suggestions and friendly advice, such as, you should apply for that job. Or, You should try that new restaurant. The past form of the modal should is should have plus the past participle. For example, I should have brought my wallet. Notice that the main verb brought is in the past participle form. Use should have to express regret or a negative feeling about the past. Imagine you trusted someone and that person later cheated on you. You could say, I should have known better than to trust him. The Beatles used the expression in a popular song. What we will talk about is ought to. Ought to is another modal for giving advice. Sometimes ought to sounds more like oughta as in this romantic song by Al Green. is similar in meaning to should, but it is not used as often. In modern American English, ought to is seldom used with the past tense or in the question form. Let's move on to had better. Had better is stronger than should and ought to. Had better carries an indirect threat. For example, if you said, You had better finish that report. You are not making a polite suggestion. You are making an indirect threat. 
In other words, if you don't finish the report, you are in trouble. Authority figures sometimes use had better when speaking to people below them. Parents also use this form often. Listen to cartoon character Mallory Archer. Mallory is the head of a spy agency. People think she is arrogant and heartless. Listen to her tone when she uses had better. Oh, for, I'll send up some help. And Missy, you had better watch it. As you can hear, Mallory is not making a polite suggestion. She is threatening someone in a lower position. Had better is not always impolite. It could express a sense of urgency, as in, Your plane is leaving. You had better run. In other words, If you don't run, you will miss your flight. Had better has no past tense or question form. Should, ought to, and had better can be difficult for English learners to hear. Native speakers often shorten these words in casual conversation. In rapid speech, modals seem to disappear because they are shortened and often fall on unstressed syllables. We will read some examples for you. The first sentence will be in slow, careful speech. Then we will read it again in rapid, informal speech. I should have been listening to what she had to say. I should have been listening to what she had to say. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You had better decide what you want to do. You'd better decide what you want to do. That's all the advice we have for you today. There is much more to learn about modals. We will cover them in more detail in future episodes. Until then, you should practice modals with British... Now it's your turn. Think of a friend that you would like to give some advice. Write to us in the comments section. Write two sentences using should, ought to, or had better giving advice. We'll give you feedback. Jill Robbins. And I'm Andrew Smith. You're listening to Lesson of the Day on the Learning English Podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our series, Let's Learn English. The series shows Ana Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C. In a recent Lesson of the Day on the Learning English Podcast, Jill and I talked about people watching. It's something Anna enjoys doing on her lunch break at work. Here's Anna in Lesson 15 of the series. Hello! People from all over the world come to Washington, D.C. When I'm at work, I love eating lunch outside. I like to watch people walking by. They all look very different. Today, my friend Ashley is eating lunch with me. Ashley... Today, the weather is beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is. <sighs> Ooh, we have to return to work. No, we have time. Let's people watch a little more. Okay. Anna enjoys noticing the differences and similarities between the people she sees walk by. Her friend Kiana likes to watch people too and joins her. The weather is beautiful, and people watching is fun. 
I love people watching too. Well, have a seat. It is fun to see how people are different or the same. It is. For example, Anna, you are tall, but Ashley and I are short. And Kiana, you and Ashley have brown eyes. I have blue eyes. You two have black skin and I have dark skin. Ashley, you have straight hair. Kiana and I have curly hair. You have very curly hair, Anna. These differences between people are easy to see. We can say that the differences are obvious, which means easy to see or understand. But other differences are more subtle. That's spelled S U B T L E. But we do not pronounce the letter B in the word. Subtle describes something that is not immediately obvious or easy to notice. As we were saying in a previous podcast, if you know a culture really well, then you might be able to notice subtle differences within that culture. Like an American might be able to make a better guess about where a person is from in the U.S. or about their socioeconomic status, based on the person's clothes or accent, or maybe some other small details, than a person who is not from the U.S. True, the American might notice more small differences, but we still have to be careful not to judge other people too quickly. For example, a rich person and a poor person. Might wear almost the same kind of informal clothes, like jeans and a T-shirt. Yep, that's right. I remember when I was working in a store, our manager reminded us that you can never be sure which customers have a lot of money. A millionaire can look just the same as somebody who has almost no money. You're listening to lesson of the day on the Learning English podcast. Andrew, I noticed you're using some more advanced vocabulary today. Let's explain the term socioeconomic. It generally refers to the combination of the amount of money you make, your education, and certain kinds of power you have. So, if you have a lot of education plus a high income, plus a high position in business or government. Your socioeconomic status is high. Status can refer to the importance and respect you have in your group or in society, such as your level within a hierarchy. That's another advanced but useful word, hierarchy. That's spelled H-I-E-R-A-R-C-H-Y. A hierarchy is a system of organizing people. Into different levels of importance or power. The military is probably the best example. There is a clear hierarchy from the generals at the top to the ordinary soldiers at the bottom, with different levels of officers in between. Let's review the vocabulary we've explained. The words are obvious, subtle, socioeconomic, and hierarchy. Obvious and subtle have opposite meanings, and socioeconomic status can refer to one's position in the hierarchy of a society. Jill, a minute ago, you said that we have to be careful not to judge other people too quickly. I certainly agree, and that reminds me of another word we started to talk about in a previous Learning English podcast. You mean the word stereotype? I do. Could you explain a bit about this word? Sure. A stereotype is a kind of oversimplified generalization about a group of people, based on a fixed image or idea about that group. And when you say fixed, you mean unchanging. Yes, stereotypes don't allow for much change. They assume that a group of people. Always have the same characteristics, 
and that's just one way they oversimplify or overgeneralize. So, for example, if I said something like, Italians love to eat pasta, listen to opera, and watch soccer, that would be an obvious example of stereotyping. Right, because while it's true that a lot of Italians do like soccer or eat pasta, there's probably millions of people in Italy who do not like to eat pasta or watch soccer. Just like a lot of Americans do not like to eat hamburgers and hot dogs. After all, there are about 300 million people in the U.S. With that many people and people coming from all over the world to live in the U.S., there's quite a bit of cultural variety. And this topic reminds me, there's an interesting talk our listeners can watch and listen to online by the writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. It's called The Danger of a Single Story. Adichie grew up in Nigeria, and she talks about how people in Western countries can have stereotypes about people from Africa and how she herself sometimes oversimplified other groups of people. So, if we only have a single story, or a stereotype, about other people, that means we are missing the complexity of individuals and the diversity within their culture. Jill, where can people find Adichie's talk online? The website is ted.com, and that's spelled T-E-D. There are a lot of talks there, and they are often called TED Talks. You can search for the danger of a single story on the website, and you can also read a transcript of what she says. I've just found it on my computer. Wow! It says her talk has been viewed over 34 million times. Well, I thought it was interesting, and I guess a lot of other people do, too. Well, Jill, we've gone from Anna people watching at her lunch break to an inspiring talk by a writer from Nigeria. It's interesting how one thing leads to another. And how one word can lead to another. Let's repeat a few key vocabulary words from today's podcast. Good idea. I'll say one, then you say one. Okay. Obvious. Subtle. Socioeconomic. Status. Hierarchy. Stereotype. Fixed. And how about inspiring? You said Adichie's talk on TED.com was inspiring. That's right, I did. And inspiring means it gives you a strong, positive feeling and perhaps makes you want to do something good. And we certainly hope our listeners are inspired to learn more with the series Let's Learn English and with the lesson of the day on the Learning English podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Andrew Smith. That's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. <laughs>